February 12, 1983, a routine shipping run from Norfolk, Virginia to Brayton Point, Massachusetts turned into a fatal voyage and one of America's worst maritime disasters. It was a bad storm. The Weather Bureau called it the worst East Coast storm in 40 years. The Marine Electric bulk carrier, similar to this ship, was transporting more than 24,000 tons of coal. A crew of 34 merchant mariners were aboard. Most of the crew and officers considered the Marine Electric uh, a real milk run. They always knew that they were only 30 miles off the coast, and if something went wrong, the Coast Guard could come out and get them. But as the Marine Electric left the Chesapeake Bay in the early morning hours of February 11th, bad weather off the coast was setting a fatal scenario in motion. Then, in the dead of night on February 12th, the situation aboard the coal carrier went from uneasy to desperate. Then it was about 1.30 when the ship was getting into trouble. The seas, they were breaking, coming right down the deck, down to number two and three hatch. We said we're in very serious trouble. Her bow was noticeably heavier as the ocean waves crashed onto the deck. Less than two hours later, the Marine Electric was listing to starboard and going down in 29 degree water. So we started to lower the lifeboat, starboard lifeboat. And just as we were doing that, the ship capsized right down on her side. In less than a minute, this happened. The ship made a noise that one of the officers described like water going down a drain magnified a billion times. It capsized onto its right side, trapping many of the men under the ship, spilling all of them into the ocean. The entire crew of 34 men plunged into the frigid waters with no survival suits. 31 men would die that night. What fatal engineering flaws caused this disaster? The Marine Electric was a World War II tanker ship, also known as a T-2 tanker. She was nearly 40 years old. They weren't really designed to last forever. Uh, the, the feeling was you made about 30 trips, it was going to get torpedoed. Uh, who knew what would happen? After World War II, these ships were used as commercial vessels and oftentimes converted to different uses. In the 1970s and the 1960s, it was common for these vessels to be, in effect, cut in half and enlarged by inserting a midsection. The common term for this process was jumboize. The Marine Electric was jumboized to 605 feet, nearly twice her original length. Now, of course, you can probably do this safely if you go back and examine the engineering drawings and figure out how to, how to properly increase the size and where to supplement the framing of the ship. I think it's fair to say this was never done. Yet while jumboizing probably weakened the Marine Electric, it wasn't the flaw that sealed her fate. Chief Mate Bob Cusick was part of the Marine Electric crew for five years and a mariner for over 40 years. Just weeks before the disaster, he pointed out innumerable weak spots throughout the ship, including the 40-foot-wide cargo hatch covers. I draw up sketches and exactly where it was, the holes, and submit them to the captain. He submitted them to the steamship company. One of those things is like a Greek tragedy. The compromised hatch covers were not properly repaired. We'd just keep patching them. We'd put uh, some duct tape over them and then some... We called it Red Hand, where it's like Bondo using a hole in a car. There was over 97 different uh, holes. Those cargo hatch covers would doom the Marine Electric. But it would take a legal battle to reveal the truth. Bob Cusick, Paul Dewey, and Eugene Kelly were the only survivors of the Marine Electric tragedy and led the crusade. A steamship company has to show that they didn't send the ship out in unseaworthy condition. It's a big difference if they know about it or they don't know about it. The bitter battle started with the victims' families on one side and Marine Transport Lines, or MTL, the owners of the Marine Electric and the Coast Guard, on the other. The official Marine Board of Investigation started the week after the ship sank. But unlike other investigations, this one was an investigation that had actual witnesses who had survived. And in this case, all three of them abandoned the code of silence and wanted to tell the true story of how their comrades died 
and why. MGL set out to prove that the crew, and especially Bob Cusick, was at fault for the sinking. It hired the best underwater divers with the newest high-tech equipment to examine the wreckage. They figured if they could show that the crew, namely me, where I was the chief officer, and that I had loaded the ship wrong or uh, hadn't secured the hatches or the anchors or something, they would have been off the hook. But it soon became clear that the crew wasn't at fault. The survivors of the Marine Electric revealed that inspections of the ship, conducted by both the Coast Guard and the American Bureau of Shipping, were cursory at best, and in some instances, completely false. The investigation now focused on the weakened hatch covers. Later testimony would show that the Coast Guard certified that the hatch covers were uh, of, uh, of a good quality and of a good strength when the hatch covers at that time weren't even on the ship. What Cusick was able to show on the stand was that the hatch covers were riddled with holes, that the men were so afraid of the hatch covers that they wouldn't walk on them for fear of falling to their deaths into the bottom of the ship. They had patched them and patched the patches. The pounding waves had burst through the disintegrating metal hatch covers and into the number one and number two cargo holds. Dominic Colicchio, captain in the U.S. Coast Guard, former merchant marine, and part of the Marine Investigation Board analyzing the Marine Electric sinking, didn't turn a blind eye. He asked the hard-hitting questions and didn't relent under pressure. Because of his tenacity, the final report made an impact well beyond the Marine Electric case. Essentially, the report findings said that a great number of the, of the ships in the American fleet were unsound. The inspections that the Coast Guard had done were inadequate. And the board also said that the American Bureau of Shipping had a conflict of interest in inspecting these ships because their fee was in fact paid by the ship owners. Because of Colicchio's determination, mandates were created to improve the shipping industry and prevent similar loss of life. Well, the legacy of the Marine Electric is a very positive one. Its loss, um, arguably the worst loss in American commercial maritime history, produced a lot of very positive changes. Number one, uh, there were much tougher uh, Coast Guard inspection standards placed so that these old ships were removed from the water. Secondly, ships that plied the North Atlantic during the winter had to carry survival suits. And the third major reform was the institution of the now famous U.S. Coast Guard Rescue Swimmer Team that helps people who are in very cold water who can't help themselves. In 2001, a memorial was erected at the Massachusetts Maritime Academy to the 31 souls who succumbed to the sea that fateful night. By giving their lives to the ocean, the crew of the Marine Electric actually prevented countless others from suffering the same fate. They left behind a legacy of reform and justice.